It, you know, you make me feel like a rock star in front of so many people, but be, don't worry, I'm not going to sing. So uh, uh, what I'll try to do in the next few minutes is give you an overview of what we are doing in Europe to support the member states in their efforts to modernize uh, vocational education and training. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's the fifth or sixth time I come to the Basque country. It's probably one of the regions in Europe that I visited uh, most frequently. But in fact, it's because we have a sort of a, a, a love affair with the Basque country. You know, uh, you, you listened to my commissioner in the beginning of this conference saying how much we take inspiration from the excellent examples uh, that we see in the Basque country. And then you also saw Jorge Arevalo saying how much his, uh, uh, you know, his work is related to what we are doing in Europe. And I think this is really a love affair. We love what they're doing, and they love what we're doing, so it's going very well. And I'm happy to come here as many times as you wish, uh, Jorge Arevalo. So, I would like... <laughs> Thank you. What I'll try to do uh, is basically cover four topics. I, I see that they put the clock there now. Oh, you don't see it. I, I see the clock there. Uh, basically, I'll try to emphasize what everyone already knows, but give some, uh, uh, maybe a different kind of view on it, on understanding change, understanding the tremendous pace of change, and that's what differentiates from the past, because there's always been change. I mean, from the agriculture uh, 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 revolution to all the other industrial revolutions, there's always been change, but I think what makes it different this time is the speed of change. And I'll try to cover that a little bit and what it means for education. And then on seizing the opportunity that we shouldn't be afraid of change. We should embrace it and see how best we can take advantage of it for the way we are delivering VET and also for equipping people, empowering people to take advantage of it. Then I'll go on to the third topic is telling you a little bit about a new initiative that we are launching, very much inspired of what we saw in the Basque country, which is the Centers of Vocational Excellence. And then I'll finish by saying how we are trying to address this complexity through transnational cooperation, bringing technica in connection with what is happening in the Netherlands, what is happening in Germany, in, in Romania, in Denmark. So trying to build European platforms where we can all learn from each other because we all, no matter how advanced the Basque system is, there is space for learning from what is done in other uh, countries, both within Europe and outside Europe, and the others have also a lot to learn from what is going on in the Basque country. So going on to the future and understanding a little bit of change, uh, I think this slide, what it tries to, uh, the image it tries to pass is that, you know, we are living, as I said, tremendous change, and what is happening is that, uh, for example, the change that happened in the first Industrial Revolution, it would possibly be absorbed by various generations. So change happened, it had an impact in the labor market, it had an impact in the kind of skills that were needed, but it would be relatively slow. So the education system had time to adapt People had time to go to school and learn, and everything was very slow, and there would be various generations absorbing the impact of change. And what is happening now is two phenomena happening at the same time. First of all, the life expectancy is increasing dramatically. If you see in the 1750s, the uh, life expectancy was around 37 years. In 2050, it's expected to be 90 years. So we are going to live longer, and the speed of change is Quick and quick, it means that in one single generation, each one of us is going to live through various uh, uh, change processes. So we've got to adapt constantly, which is a, a, a luxury that could be uh, uh, lived back uh, 100 years ago, but we can no longer afford this. So there's a, a need for people to see the way they adapt to these changes in a completely different way. Just to give you an idea of how value uh, has changed over the years. In this slide, you can see on the, on the left side, in 1917s, the, the value was extracted from natural assets. So if you look, steel companies, telephone companies, petrol companies, that's where the value was 100 years ago. Then we moved, after the uh, third uh, industrial revolution, we moved into scalable production of human-made assets. So companies like IBM, producing technology, were at the forefront. Uh, AT&T, Kodak, producing uh, photograph material, was at the forefront. So it was human, no longer natural assets, exploiting natural assets, but already technology being the most valued. And what we have now, and it shows you that in each of these moments, the kind of skills people need are completely different. What we have now is 
companies that are capable of creating uh, value from digital assets are the ones that are most valued, starting with uh, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft. So you see the change that has happened in society and the, the value that companies have and what this represents in terms of skills needs to adapt to these realities. So these first two slides is to give you a picture of how things have changed. And what does this mean for education? In this paragraph, you'll see the old paradigm, which basically says that, you know, the first 25 years of your life was to educate. You got educated, and you had a diploma from university or vocation, a vocational school that would equip you to be, you'd go to employment and say, you know, I'm an electrician or I am an engineer. And you get a job and you work during 40 years, and then if you work well and you, uh, you can, then you go on retirement and that's the end of it. No need for continuous uh, learning because you basically got educated, you were prepared for life. This is the bottom, the old paradigm. The new paradigm in which we are moving to is change is constant. There are peaks, ups and downs, but change is, is constant. And we have to move from a paradigm of being educated, getting a qualification, from lifelong learning engagement. People have to understand that in order to adapt to these constant changes, you have the blue line in which basically it says that you have keep on learning throughout your life. You've got work, of course, and even after work, you still need to remain engaged. Because, you know, for example, my mother, if she wants to get a medical appointment quicker, she should go to the internet, and she's 86 years of age, she should go to the internet to make a medical appointment. It means digital skills. She never learned digital skills. She will not learn. But people will need this throughout life, you know, to do tax uh, declarations. You will need this, even when you leave the labor market. So there's a constant need to upgrade your skills even beyond the period in which you are in the labor market. So this is a sort of a change paradigm of being educated to being continuously engaged in learning. Now, I'd like to share with you this video from the Scottish Skills Agency. Is the sound working? No. Can you do something about it? I, I thought of putting this video so that we just understand, you know, uh, the key messages that come from the video is, first of all, we've got to understand what is happening, you know, be attentive of all the developments that are there. Then collaboration, I think it's the new sort of competitiveness uh, uh, mantra. If you want to be competitive, we need to collaborate. We've got to see behind, beyond our own belly buttons and collaborate with others in other regions, in other countries, in other continents, and accept diversity much better. And then create your own, empower yourself to understand that in order to be employable, in order to have quality lives, we need to 
uh, uh, take charge of our own learning process throughout the life. Now, uh, going to the second part of the presentation, Basically, the idea here is to tell that in spite of all this change, there is hope. It's not that we are in a, in a, in a condemned to something negative. What we have to is, as I was saying, understand the change and embrace it and do something about it. And I would say that my commissioner that you saw in the previous video, it's unfortunate that you know, the commission is now changing. We had European elections. We'll have a new commissioner. But I've been working in the commission for 30 years. And I must say that uh, she's been the most engaged commissioner with vocational education and training. She's been really, since the first day, saying that she wanted to make that a first choice in Europe. This idea that Annette also spoke about, that usually people perceive vocational training as a second quality choice, that only if something goes wrong, uh, that people wanted to go into the high education or they dropped out of school, only then they go into VET. She wants to change this. Of course, VET is also a solution for those people, but it's much more than that. It's also something that is necessary to empower people with the skills to have life projects, as was said earlier this morning in another presentation, and empower them to have fulfilling lives. And that's the kind of work that we've been trying to do at the European Commission, cooperating with the member states in order to pursue it. And uh, uh, I... I usually like to put the slide because it sort of brings us to the ground, because quite often we get lost in excellence, innovation, competitiveness, and we forget that education is not something neutral, that it has a purpose and it has to be linked with the kind of societies we have. If we have an aspiration to have a, a society that you know, cares for the others, that makes sure that nobody is left behind, education system has to be framed in that context. If we are just worried about competitiveness and making sure that we are above all all the others and no matter how many people stay behind that's not a problem then education will be a, a, a mirror of that image and uh, uh, my former boss Jacques Delors he was the guy responsible for the internal market in Europe also for the Erasmus program it was during his uh, presidency of the Commission that we had it. He co-authored a document by UNESCO that spoke about the four pillars of education. And I think that when we're talking about reforms of the future, what uh, that should be, we always have to think about this. And basically these four pillars of education is first of all learning to know. You know, of course, if you don't know something, you cannot do anything about it. So the school has a very important role in that, in teaching people content, you know, maths, uh, uh, science, technology, uh, biology, we have that uh, responsibility. But that's not enough, because you might know a, no a lot, but not be capable of doing anything with it. And I think their vocational training is very important, because it not only provides you with knowledge, but then it provides you with opportunity to do something about the knowledge, working with your hands in a factory, in a, in a kitchen, wherever. It makes this link of knowing and doing. And then learning to be, you know, learning where we are in the world, culture learning to understand what is fake news, what is not, critical thinking. So these are the elements that the school should do, and the education system should also provide. And last but not least, the learning to live together, learning to accept diversity, work with different cultures, different languages, different people, people that see the world completely different, that have different options in life. And education system also has this role, and vocational and training as well. So this is basically, if we want to think of any future education system, I think these uh, uh, pillars that were pertinent back in 1996 continue as pertinent today. Now, still on VET, what are the major dimensions that we are working on in Europe in order to modernize vocational education and training? First of all, innovative VET. VET that contributes to the innovation process in society, to modernize our societies, our, our economies, because if we don't have prosperity, there's no way of having quality of life as well. So we've got to make sure that that is also contributing, and the initiative that I'll speak about in a few minutes has very much to do with that. But of course, VET that is also inclusive, that reaches out to the very best, but also to those that have difficulties, that sometimes don't fit in the normal education system. We have to reach out to them, make sure that we provide them with opportunities to also have fulfilling lives. Then quality vet, a vet that is responsive to what is happening outside, that is connected to industry, to uh, uh, companies, to society in general, understands and provides solutions for it. So quality vet, responsive, 
to also labor market and also social needs. And sustainable vet, a vet that can, for example, contribute to the implementation of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, vet that can provide people with the skills they need to address climate change for the uh, green jobs that are coming ahead, and also, and I think this is one important element and an uh, important change compared to the past, is a vet that is serving lifelong learning uh, process. This is very much related to the slide I showed you before, the changing paradigm of being educated to being engaged in lifelong learning. So VET has to provide not only young people with the skills they need to get a job tomorrow, but also adults to continuous upskill and reskill throughout their lives. So these are, if you want, the major dimensions on which we are thinking about VET when we at the European Commission are working with the member states to develop a new strategy. And we all know this, but I think it's important to say that VET is not only about technical skills. Technical skills are important, but knowing that people will have to make various transitions throughout their lives and possibly the job that they start, their first job, will not be their last job, we've got to make sure that people also have the foundation skills, and we're talking about science, technology, maths, and so on, the transversal skills that allow them to adapt in these transitions, so creative thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, innovative attitudes, and of course, specialized skills as well, because it's not good enough that you have a, a pilot that is very good communicating but doesn't know how to drive a plane. I'm sure no one would want it or be operated by a surgeon that is very good communicating and very good in problem solving but is not capable of doing a surgery as they should. So, of course, that is also needed, but what we see is a sort of a shift of what was the focus from specialized skills to more and more of these solid foundation and transversal skills that will allow people to adapt throughout their lives. Now, I'm going to this uh, last part of the presentation, which has to do with the new initiative we have. And I'd like to say, I've said it already before, but it's very much inspired in what is the model of vocational education and training in the bus country. There are various elements here which we find that, that are at the forefront of uh, thinking of a modern vet that is responsive to, to, to uh, soci societal needs, both economic and of uh, uh, social uh, uh, needs. And what we've been doing, not only looking at the Basque model, but inspired by it, we've been trying to see in Europe what are the approaches to vocational excellence? What makes a vocational center be seen as excellent? It be seen as excellent by the learners because they find that when they take a course in that vocational center, they easily get a job and they can do these transitions we're talking about excellent by the employers because they feel that this vocational center is providing them with the people that have the skills they need in order to be competitive and also for the schools, the teachers, the staff that are there, that they feel fulfilled, that they're doing a job that has societal value. So we've been trying to look throughout Europe, besides Technica, who else is doing this and what are the common characteristics between all these experiences that make them unique. So trying to find the common denominator that we see throughout all these vocational excellence experience. And we've also been looking at theory. What has been happening over the years when we're talking about excellence, what does it mean? Who has researched on this? And we've, I will try in the next few minutes to give you a, a, a summary of what it is. So the, the centers of vocational excellence, basically what they aim to do is to build skills ecosystems in the areas where they work. So contribute to build skills ecosystems so that the economy can count on these uh, uh, vocational centers as key elements of providing them with the skills that are needed in society. And an important element that we see is that it is not enough that the vocational center modernizes itself. You can modernize as much as you want, but if the economy then doesn't work, if there's no strategic focus of the policymakers, you won't get anywhere. So I think this, what we try to say over here is that basically, you know, you've got, does this work? Yes. For skills ecosystems to work, you need, first of all, that the policymakers have put their act together, that they see education not in isolation, but closely related to what is employment policies, what is industrial policies, what are social policies. So education and training has to be inserted in this wider, comprehensive policy approach. Because if you just focus on one element, the others will not work. The second element is that companies as well understand that they have a role to play in skills development, and that the companies will only do so when they value, when they see that skills is fundamental for their innovation, for their competitiveness, and for their 
final balance sheet. This is very important. Companies cannot just wait for the education system to provide them with the skills they need. They have to be engaged. They have to support the vocational centers in identifying what are the skill needs today and the future. They have to work together in partnerships. Of course, and individuals, you'll only convince them, especially adults, to continue uh, uh, training throughout or learning throughout their lives if they see a personal benefit as well. If they see that if I invest in my own training, I'm going to be more employable. Maybe I'm going to get the career promotion more easily. So this aspect, we also have to, uh, to uh, take attention of it, is that people will not engage in learning just for the sake of it. They have to see what are the benefits and really understand that it is something that they want to do because they want to improve their lives. And of course, the, 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 the important element is that the vocational training system as well has to be attentive to what is happening and provide a, a, a responsive uh, system of skills development that provides society what they need. So basically the idea I want to say is that you need to act in these various areas. And it's not me inventing this. This is a guy called David Finnegold already in 1999 that came with this theory. And he also identified that to do so, you've got to bring together policymakers, companies, chambers, vet institutions, universities of applied science. So we're not talking about ghettos. We're talking about bringing all these people together to understand how they can all work together to provide solutions at a local level. So besides this one, and I'm going to go very quickly through this, we've also seen the Asian Development Bank has developed a model of networks of centers of excellence. We've tried to take some ideas of there to develop our concept ourselves. We've also looked, we're working very closely with UNESCO Univoc, and I know Technica is also a member of UNESCO Univoc Innovation Hubs, and they are doing something very similar to what we are doing in the Centers of Vocational Excellence, in which they are looking at how uh, uh, vocational education and training can contribute to innovation at the local level. So you'll see that there's a lot of parallels between what Uni Univoc is doing and what we are doing at the European Commission as well. We're also looking how we can find a place for vocational education and training in the knowledge triangle. You know that whenever there's talk about knowledge triangle, people usually talk about universities, talk about research centers, talk about businesses, and forget completely that, as if we were, you know, the guys that, what can you contribute to innovation? What can you contribute to research? But I think Craig uh, this morning mentioned it very well, that, you know, innovation is not only about breakthrough innovation of some guys that are in a remote laboratory somewhere, you know, looking at all these scientific apparatus. A lot of innovation happens in a very practical level. Is the vocational center working with a company, helping them address a business idea that they have or improve a production process. This is innovation as well. And in fact, most of the innovation is of that type and not necessarily these big laboratories hidden somewhere where people are just doing academics for the sake of academics. So, and VET has a very important place uh, to play in it and the Centers of Vocational Excellence are trying to see how we can place ourselves in this context as well. Now, in this mapping exercise, remember I told you that we've been looking throughout Europe and until now, we've identified 25 different activities that are sort of common whenever we see centers of vocational excellence. And if you want, of these 20, uh, beyond these 25 activities, we've identified key success factors. None of them are surprising. I think they are quite intuitive. But I, I think the first, so whenever you have excellence in VET, these key factors are always there. First of all, is that they must be anchored into frameworks of regional development, innovation, and smart specialization. So if you have a, a vocational center working in abstract without being part of a strategy, and George Revalo said it very well this uh, morning, if you don't know where you're going, any route is possible. You can take any path because it will take you nowhere. It's, so you need to know where you're going, and, you, and that has to provide things that are inserted in a wider strategy, in a wider policy. Then the integration of activities. VET is best when it provides a set of activities or services. It's not only providing a qualification, it's not only providing a paper at the end of the day that gives the learner that paper. It is providing them with entrepreneurship skills. It's providing them with the incubator. If they want to develop an idea, they can, in the vet center or somewhere associated with the vet center, develop this idea with the support of the teachers that are there, with the support maybe of regional development authorities. It has to have services, for example, innovation hubs, 
working very closely with companies or small and medium-sized enterprises to develop ideas. It has to be capable, for example, of validating formal learning. And Annette also spoke about this, so that you don't, you make the systems more efficient. You don't tell people to repeat what they already know. So it's a set of services, and what we see is that when there's the integration of services, the kind of uh, excellence that is produced is much higher. And then strong and enduring partnerships. Vet centers cannot work in isolation. They have to work very closely with universities of applied science, with research parks, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 businesses, with apprenticeships, internships. So it has to be part of the society of the area where it is working. Now, we've seen already in this mapping exercise, I'm just going to very quickly go through four examples, and you'll see that all of them are completely different. And what I want with this is to tell you that there's not one bulletproof solution that you can just take the Basque model and apply it everywhere and it will work. Or you can take the German model, apply it everywhere, it will work. It is not the case. And in each case, there are particularities that led to that solution, which is a good solution. And we've got to see what each region has to see is what elements are there that we can inspire ourselves to apply to our reality. In Belgium, in the Valonia region, for example, they have approach to vocational excellence, these competence centers that bring vocational training, uh, uh, public employment services, agencies forecasting future skill needs, technological observatories and bringing them all together to provide these skills ecosystems that I was talking about. Then you have other examples like France, where they, very much like the Basques, are looking at what are European level strategies? How does this translate into national level strategies, into regional level strategies? And what, how can VET system support this development? And they've got a very close link with what is the cluster policies in France and the industrial strategies in France and linking them very closely to the VET centers. So the VET centers are contributing to the aerospace cluster, to the automotive cluster, wherever they are, they are closely linked to this uh, strategy. Then we have the Dutch example, and there will be someone talking about the Dutch example in the next few minutes, so I will not get into this, but basically it's, it's, it's focused on a national project that has the intention of developing business education partnerships. So bringing this, what they call the, the, the three helix uh, system of businesses, schools, and government working together in order to develop innovation and excellence. And then <coughs> I will finish with this example, which you all know. I suppose you've seen this, this um, um, slide various times, in which there's approach, the, the, the Basque approach, which is different to the others, in which there was a clear intention of developing a technological innovation system where vocational education and training is one of the key elements. So the whole system was built with the intention. They developed Technica, which is a sort of a research center trying to provide the very latest of knowledge, of pedagogy, of new materials coming up so that they can then filter out through whole the region. So this is a different approach to what we saw the French, the Belgian, and what we can see in many others that I didn't present. So it's just to tell you that there's no one model fits all, but there are good elements in all of them, and what we are going to try to do at the European level is provide the means for all of them to work in platforms so that they learn from the very best of each other and then are capable of translating this to what is their national or regional uh, 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 reality. The last message I want to pass to you is how are we doing this? So we've seen in the beginning, I showed you the first part was the change that is happening, the complexity of change. The second part was telling you, but don't despair because there are solutions and this is an excellent opportunity for us to rethink the way we uh, provide education and training. And now the last part is how are we addressing this? And to tell you, the Centers of Vocational Excellence, the initiative itself, it has, you know, there's a company called ABB, that they have a motto that says, uh, think global, act local. And the Centers of Vocational Excellence is very much like that, because the vocational training is usually providing people with skills for jobs in the local market. So they're thinking local. 
However, if you just think local and you're not aware of what is happening in the world, of developments that are happening, of opportunities that are happening, of the export markets where you are happening, you lose sight of the big picture. And when we're talking about globalization, rapid technological change, you have to be in touch with reality. So our idea of the Center of Vocational Excellence is, first of all, the, the main focus of action is at the regional level, but we do it by creating European platforms of centers of vocational excellence that want to get together, want to develop this approach of excellence, want to develop these 25 activities that I mentioned that we will publish very soon in a report that is going to be published. Now, we've uh, clustered these activities, the 25 activities that I mentioned, in three big groupings. One has to do with teaching and training. So what are the activities that make a vocational center excellent and uh, the cluster of teaching and, and, and learning, on cooperation and partnerships, so on uh, uh, applied research, on uh, apprenticeships, companies sharing their equipment with schools, because sometimes schools don't have the, the, the financial capacity to buy the latest robots, but there are companies there that might have them. How do they cooperate in order to share this and share teachers and trainers as well? And the last one is on governance and funding. How do we make sure we bring all the partners together? Who says what? Who determines what is being done? And how is this all financed? How do we share public, private and individual investment in order to take this forward? Now, uh, this is just a slide that gives you an example of some of the 25 activities. You'll see the yellow ones are the ones that fall under the chapter of teaching and training, the green ones on cooperation and partnerships, and the blue ones on governance and funding. So, for example, I'm just going to mention these, the yellow ones on teaching and training, a vocational excellence center is one that not only cares about initial qualifications for the young, but also provides services for upskilling and reskilling of the adults. It's a vocational center that looks at innovating the curricula, looking at new IT possibilities of developing curricula, that looks at quality assurance mechanisms, that tries to develop incubators to support their learners to build, their, to uh, produce their own jobs. So these are the kind of activities, well, there are 25, I just put some of them here for you to have an idea of what is our concept of vocational excellence. And, hola, oh, this went weak, quick. Now, just to tell you, how are we piloting? The, the, I forgot to mention in the beginning, and my time is out, I forgot to mention in the beginning that uh, the Centers of Vocational Excellence is a European initiative that is going to be financed under the next Erasmus program starting in 2021. We're going to have a call in 2020. We've asked the member states to allocate around 200 million euros to support these European platforms. But until 2021, so until the call that we're going to launch in 2020, we are, have launched some pilot projects because we have the idea, we have the concept developed, but we want to see how the market is understanding it, how they would establish these platforms. Would it be more with universities? Would it be more with companies, with vocational centers at tertiary level? How will it be done so that we can then fine tune the calls and the support we will give after 2021. And we had the first call in 2019. We had, project, we had money for four projects. We got 15 applications. We are analyzing them right now. The results will be out in about a month. We are now preparing a second set of pilot projects with five times more uh, funding for this year. It's going to be published in October. And in 2021 to 2027, we'll have the full support of Erasmus program. If the member states agree with our proposal, there'll be around 200 million euros to support the development of this concept. I'd like to finish with a short video which was done for the um, uh, smart specialization strategy, but it is very much about what is the core intention of the Centers of Vocational Excellence.
this is what I had to share with you today. I'm very happy that the World Federation of Community Colleges and Polytechnics next year will be taking place in the bus country, and I've seen that the theme of the, the meeting will be excellence for all, which fits very well with what we're doing. And the last word I wanted to tell you is that we want this initiative not to just be a European initiative, not because we want, uh, we are nice guys and we want to save the world, but we think that there's advantage of collaborating with other countries, with other knowledge in other parts of the world, and the Centers of Vocational Excellence will be an initiative which will also allow partners from South America, from Asia, from Africa, because we believe that in order to develop knowledge, to develop this concept of excellence the way we are thinking of it, we need to bring intelligence from all over the world and we want these platforms to be a way of upward convergence of VET, to improve VET in Europe, but also to help improve VET in the world. So thank you very much.